Hello, um, thank you very much for uh, for the invitation. Um, I was asked to um, speak about uh, some recent work that uh, we have done in collaboration with Quantimol uh, that should um, allow us to um, expand the range of calculations that we can do on electron molecule collisions towards uh, heavier species and to include uh, uh, some relativistic effects. <clears throat> Could be yeah. uh, very technical, so I mean, I tried to spice it up by putting in some uh, recent results uh, that we that we achieved on the perfluoroalkyl molecules. So just uh, briefly, uh, some simple overview of uh, what it is that uh, our group in in Prague is, uh, is doing. Uh, we are studying, uh, of course, electron molecule collisions. Um, and we are looking at uh, basically all kinds of processes from just uh, simple elastic uh, collisions. We compute the cross-sections, the angular distributions. We are also looking at uh, resonances. Um, and when collaboration with our colleagues in our department, we are looking at nuclear dynamics in, in electron molecule collisions. <clears throat> in particular, we're looking at uh, dissociative electron attachment and vibrational excitation, mostly in smaller molecules, but uh, of course, uh, in the future, we would like to extend it to larger molecules. We're also studying electronically inelastic collisions, and this is an example for pyrimidine, uh, which I will just... Uh, talk about briefly later on. And we are also looking at, uh, in collaboration with uh, with other people, such as uh, Petr Slavicek, who's a quantum chemist, um, and with uh, Mark Kushner, we are also looking at, um, at uh, larger species, uh, such as this dielectric gas molecule Novak, but also these peripheral archaeal molecules. Um, so, uh, like on the in the most recent uh, time, like we have been focusing mostly on 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 photoionization calculations actually, and we can do this also in in various regimes from the weak field single photon um, regime to the multi photon and also to non perturbative regime. Um, so. Uh, we are using uh, this uh, molecular R matrix codes, uh, which have been around for, for decades. Uh, and you see some references here. Uh, there's Jonathan's uh, report from 2010 and the most recent version of the codes is summarized in this uh, 2020 paper. Um, the the basic idea, it's well, the R matrix method is a way of solving the Schrodinger equation, and it does this by dividing the, the space into two regions, one where the physics is very simple, which is the so-called outer region when the electron is very far away from the molecule and the electron uh, sees some effective potential, which is just generated by the molecule, some electrostatic potential. And this is a one electron uh, problem, which can be solved easily, but when the electron is close to the the molecule, the problem becomes very uh, complicated because all the electrons are uh, interacting and uh, there is electron exchange and uh, correlation and so forth. And to solve some techniques which are similar to quantum chemistry, such as configuration interaction, but adapted uh, for the description of, of the continuum. And so once we have solved this in a region problem, we can construct something that's called the R-matrix, that's hence the name R-matrix method, and that basically contains all the information about this complicated interaction that's taking place inside the sphere. And then we can match this uh, uh, information with the solution from the outer region. So this uh, R-matrix provides us essentially with logarithmic derivative of the wave function on the sphere. Um, so, as I said, and as you know, this has been used for decades to calculate accurate collision data of electron collisions with molecules. Uh, it's also uh, very much suitable to describe uh, all kinds of uh, bound states, such as dipole bound states or Rydberg states, and it's a variational um, and wave function based method. Um, so just a few more uh, details about this. The, the, the method in the inner region uses this uh, so-called close coupling expansion, 
which uh, represents the wave function as uh, an expansion into basis, which describes different types of processes. So for example, the first set of uh, uh, states here, this uh, phi i uh, coupled to this gamma ij, this represents the molecule in some electronic state phi i, where the electron is in the continuum. So this can describe electronic excitation. While there are some other set of functions here, chi i, which describe uh, the polarization of the molecule or formation of resonances. And uh, we can describe these wave functions of the target states on, on various levels of approximation from Hartree Fock to configuration interaction, complete active space, and most recently also something that's called ORMAS. Um, to describe the continuum, uh, we can use um, two types of orbitals, either Gaussian type orbitals, which are similar to in spirit to the orbitals uh, centered on the atoms, but we can also use B splines. And all, all of these continuum functions are centered on the center of mass, and we can freely combine them such that you can have the, the grid of B splines, which are, which are the red functions here, and they are very efficient at describing the oscillating wave function of the, of the electron. And then we can combine it with Gaussian functions, which extend over the short range uh, part of the of the wave function. Or we can use only Gaussians or only B splines. We can basically mix them freely. The important thing is that these B splines they uh, the R matrix radius in situations where it's necessary, but it comes at a very high computational cost. Um, so. Um, before I dive into the ECPs, I just want to say a few words about uh, some interesting physics that uh, that we have looked at recently. And this is uh, looking at uh, resonances, which are temporary bound states of, of the molecule. And these are very much uh, relevant for plasma modeling, where um, uh, many of the fragmentation processes proceed through resonance formation and lead to dissociative electron attachment, for example, or impact dissociation. Um, so resonances are actually solutions of the Schrodinger equation in the complex plane. So for complex energies uh, or momenta, and you can see them uh, represented here in, in, in this graph on the bottom right, where your bound states, they actually lie on the positive imaginary axis of momentum and they lead to real energies and resonances are located in the complex plane and they have both the real and imaginary part. Um, and the interesting thing about resonances is that we are actually uh, seeing them, in fact, indirectly. So the bump that we see in the cross-section is a manifestation of solution of the Schrodinger equation somewhere in the complex plane. And the resonance uh, uh, has a, some definite position on the real axis, and it has a, has a width. Um, and we see them, and we basically see them only indirectly through this uh, decay of the resonance, which is uh, proportional to uh, inversely proportional to the width of the of the resonance. And so, to be able to identify resonances in our in our data, we actually would like to see a plot like this, where we have our cross section, uh, and it can contain various features. And we can also see what's happening in the complex plane to find the solutions in the complex plane. That is uh, something which is important, especially for uh, complicated systems, such as, for example, this pyrimidine, where uh, you see in red the experimental data. Uh, so these are the cross sections for electron impact excitation on this molecule. Uh, so the red is the experiment and the black curve are our calculations. And you can see that there are various bumps in the, in the cross section and it's it's actually non-trivial to ascribe all the bumps to resonances because uh, quantum physics uh, tells us that not every bump in the cross-section is actually a resonance and so we need to investigate this properly and so this can be that that not every bump is a is a resonance can also be seen in this uh, different type of processes which is photoionization of co2 where in these calculations the photoionization to the b state of co2 uh, is actually uh, producing a bump but that's not a resonance it's just um, uh, whereas there is a large resonance in the c channel uh, so uh, 
we can actually find the resonances very efficiently using the R matrix method, and, and we have recently uh, implemented this into, into the code. Uh, so what have we applied this to uh, recently? Uh, so uh, I would like to highlight this work on uh, perfluoroalkyl uh, substances and, and Novak, uh, which were recently published. And uh, you can see, I mean, this is an example of a calculation of elastic cross-sections for PFBA and PFOA. It's not the full elastic cross-section, it's only the contribution of the lowest angular momenta of the electron, uh, which is sensitive to formation of resonances. And you can see that the cross-section is, is very complex. And if we look into the complex plane, indeed, we find that there is a large number of resonances. This is the sort of swarm of uh, points here in between, let's say, 3 to 10 electron volts. Um, so, and we see a similar picture also in Novak, uh, which is a potential SF6 uh, uh, replacement. And so these perfluoroalkyl molecules are important because they are, they are deemed to be a, a strong uh, environmental pollutant, and, and so we would like to get rid of them uh, by, you know, some chemical transformation. So, uh, we have developed a, a way uh, to calculate the uh, impact excitation cross-sections even for such large molecules using some simple approach, uh, which is the Born approximation, and it essentially disregards all structure in the, in the continuum, and it just represents the electrons as, as plane waves. I mean, this is a very simple approximation, but here when we apply it to, to Novak, and uh, we try to understand this uh, electron energy loss spectrum, we actually see that it works uh, pretty well. Uh, I mean, here, the interesting part of the plot is the comparison between the electron energy loss spectra and the VUV spectra, which is photoabsorption. And so you see that indeed this highlights the difference between, between the reactions, uh, be between the absorb, uh, between the uh, impact excitation by by electrons versus photoabsorption by by photons, and you can see that you know for for Novak um, actually this uh, this Born approximation works pretty well. Uh, so this red curve is the result uh, calculated with the Born approach, whereas uh, comparison to this pure Born dipole approach, which is essentially photoabsorption, uh, is is the the, the the yellow line. This works pretty well because the molecule has a very large dipole moment, and so so to the to the cross section at zero energies is uh, through small angle scattering, which which happens at uh, large distances from the molecule. The important thing is that in this approach, we are able to use very accurate uh, wave functions for the electronic states, uh, the ADC wave functions. So here on the right, I see I'm showing you just a comparison. I'm showing you the results for the perfluoroalkyl molecules. So here uh, there is an example of comparison between the Born results and the actual R matrix uh, results, which uh, represent the full scattering continuum. Um, so this is the comparison for for few selected uh, uh, states, so excitation into few selected states. The solid curve is the R matrix result, and the dashed is the uh, the Born result. So you can see that they are in a in a rough agreement with each other. Of course, uh, it cannot be expected to be perfect, but we see that the Born results are at least giving us some decent order of magnitude estimate at a much lower computational cost. And on the right, we see. Uh, some set of uh, a few uh, cross-sections for each of the four molecules uh, calculated with the full R matrix method. And um, we see that there is a lot of structure which comes from, from the resonances that are formed in the system. Um, not all of the peaks that we see here are physical. Some of these are caused by deficiencies of the model that we used. Uh, but um, nevertheless, we can expect that the, the dynamics in these molecules will be complicated. So uh, we have also done for, for the perfluoroalkyl uh, molecules uh, calculations of some uh, potential energy surfaces to, to get an idea of the, um, into the possible fragmentation pathways. Uh, and this was done at, a, at this ADC2 level with a fairly diffuse uh, atomic basis set. And so we see that for the, uh, for the 
sulfonic um, molecules, the loss of the sulfur and the OH group is, is dominant. Um, the solid lines are the potential energy surfaces from uh, uh, the singlet states and the dashed ones are from the triplet states. Okay, and so for PFBA, uh, we see that uh, there is not a, a big difference between the singlet and the triplet contribution, with exception of the CC bond uh, cleavage, where we see that actually the, the inclusion of the triplet states is, is, uh, is, is absolutely key to, to getting this, uh, to, to describing this, um, uh, this, um, this bond breaking. So these data that we calculated for the uh, for the uh, impact excitation, they were then fed into a zero-dimensional plasma chemistry model. This was the, the this uh, modeling was done by Mark Kushner and, and Mackenzie Meyer at Michigan University. Simulations um, uh, were done for repetitively, repetitively pulsed argon plasma at uh, atmospheric pressure, which was done in the regime of the electric barrier discharge. Um, and uh, in you see that all the different processes that were included in the in the in the uh, in the simulation, and uh, the result of the simulation was that we were observing the fragmentation of all those molecules, and uh, with the main result that basically the short chains, uh, chain molecules decompose uh, somewhat slower, uh, and also the sulfur com components uh, decompose faster. So you can see that, for, for example, for the sulfate that uh, compounds that PFBS has a slower decomposition, which is shorter range, shorter chain than the, than the longer chain. Um, and the same thing is true for, for, the, for the other two molecules. Uh, so here on the right, you see the, the contribution of all the different uh, processes to, uh, to the fragmentation. And uh, you see that you know, the dominant role here is played by dissociative electron attachment with the contribution of all the other processes uh, uh, varying the contribution of the singlet and triplet excitation, uh, sorry, sing excitation into singlet and triplet states actually varies quite a bit. Um, but uh, again, the dissociative electron attachment is, is the biggest problem. However, uh, to, to be able to say something about the nuclear, we would have to study the resonances in the continuum. And this is a very difficult problem because we would need to do many calculations for different geometries of the molecules. And this is very costly. And so this is now uh, like uh, basically why, one of the reasons why we wanted to make the calculations more efficient and uh, one way of uh, doing this would be through the so-called effective core potentials, which uh, uh, their purpose is to replace some of the electrons in your system by a mean field, by some effective potential. And the computational savings then occur in the calculation of the so-called two electron integrals, which, which uh, describe the uh, electron repulsion between, between your electrons, which are described by some atomic orbitals. And so these uh, two electron integrals are extremely costly, uh, both in terms of the memory and computation for, for, for large systems. So for example, for the PA, PFAS molecules, the calculation for one geometry of the molecule took about a week. Uh, so you can imagine that if we were to follow, for example, some resonant uh, surface, uh, that uh, you know, this would be a massive, uh, massive undertaking. So one way to alleviate the problem would be to use these ECPs, which remove some of the electrons in the system, and we need to compute uh, fewer of these two electron integrals. Additional uh, feature of these ECPs is that they include in some uh, average way, uh, relativistic effects uh, of these core electrons on the balance shells of the, of the systems. Um, so the, this ECPs, they have the following form. So the first part uh, is uh, uh, basically the standard, let's say, nuclear repulsion uh, uh, contribution uh, to the one electron Hamiltonian. And then we have contributions of these pseudo potentials, which replace the core electrons. So 
called semi-local component. So the local component is a, is a simple uh, spherically symmetric uh, potential around the center of the atom, which is parametrized using some Gaussians. And the semi-local component is uh, a potential, which again, in its uh, radial part is represented by Gaussians, but it includes this uh, spherical harmonic projector, which is sitting on, on, the, on the atom. And then the task that we had to implement is to calculate these uh, contributions uh, of the pseudo potentials uh, to the um, to the Hamiltonian, and this requires calculation of matrix elements of this uh, pseudo potential between our basis functions, which are the Gaussians sitting on the individual atoms. And we could do this uh, relatively efficiently uh, because we have similar routines implemented in our uh, code that. Um, that performs integrals between uh, these splines and Gaussians. Um, so in the current implementation, we are able to include these ECP uh, effective core potentials uh, into calculations which come to which contain, of course, the, the atomic uh, orbital sitting on the atoms, but also the continuum functions, which can be either Gaussians or B-splines. But the B-splines are in the current implementation limited such that they cannot overlap with the ECPs. Uh, the only other limitation is that the spin orbit contribution to the ECPs has not been implemented yet, but that's typically a, a minor correction. Um, so just on uh, just to show you a few of our uh, test uh, results, uh, how these ECPs perform. So these are very simple uh, models of electron collisions with some of the selected molecules. Uh, so this is uh, simple triatomics such as water and SO3. And this is a comparison here uh, uh, between the all electron calculation, which is the red curve here, and the calculation with effective core potentials. And you can see that the results are essentially identical, which means that we can obtain uh, observable, but at a, at a much reduced computation than computational cost. I would also like to highlight that in these calculations, we were able to use quite a large R matrix radius of about 20, and we use this mixed continuum basis set, which contain both the Gaussians and the P splines. This is true also for the other two molecules, which are perhaps of more interest to you, such as SF6. Um, where again the results are nearly identical with the uh, with the all electron calculation, and for chlorine the same thing is true, with exception of this uh, one uh, symmetry, where the all electron calculation predicts this uh, very large peak at the at the threshold, whereas uh, the ECP actually um, is uh, predicting a drop. But we can see that this is due to the small difference in um, in the energy, um, well, basically the ECP predicts here uh, a bound state, which is uh, is is correct because of course Cl uh, two molecule has has bound states of the negative ion, whereas the all electron calculation at this level of approximation still sees the bound state as a resonant. So this is a small uh, discrepancy here. Um, as I said at the beginning, we are not interested only in electron scattering, but also in photoionization. So we were looking at applications of this code to photoionization, and this is uh, cross-section for argon and cross-section for O3, and in both cases it performs very well. Um, and we can look at the argon cross-section in a more detail, so that the, here we see the photoionization of the 3p shell of, of argon. And this is uh, the cross-section uh, in the linear scale. And here on the bottom, we see it in the logarithmic scale. So in the linear scale, the cross-sections uh, for the two, uh, calculated on the all electron level and with two different types of ECPs, they look very much the same on the logarithmic scale. There, it, it, it reveals that there is some small discrepancy here at the high energy region. And and uh, we can explain this perhaps uh, simply by the fact that at higher energies, the photoelectron penetrates the angular momentum barrier and uh, gets closer to the core where it actually observes that, oh, there is some difference now that this is, uh, the core has been represented by some effective potential, which is of course not the same thing as the all electron calculation. Um, and here on the top right, we see the beta parameter, which characterizes the angular distribution of the photoelectrons. And again, it's nearly identical with the all electron results. And on the bottom right is the, 
the Dyson orbital, which is the initial state for the photoionization of the atom. And again, in this case, it's it's pretty much the same. So here we were comparing, uh, you know, the all electron calculation with two different ECPs, one which contains some relativistic corrections and uh, one which doesn't. And in this case, relativistic effects were totally negligible as, as expected. Uh, however, what uh, is of uh, more interest uh, to us um, is our calculations for heavier atoms such as iodine. And in, in particular, in the future, we would like to do calculations for CH3I. In fact, those calculations are in progress. But as a preparation for those, we were looking at photoionization of iodine atom, uh, in particular photoionization from the 4D shell. Uh, which is uh, a deeply bound shell in the in iodine, and it's associated with formation of the so-called giant dipole resonance. This is uh, actually a cross section for CH3I molecule photoionization cross section, which shows this massive peak. Um, uh, below 100 electron volts of photon energy. And here on the right, we see the beta parameter, the asymmetry parameter, which characterizes the, the, the photoelectron angular distribution. These are old measurements from 1984. And they are compared to uh, different types of calculations. So the solid lines are non-relativistic calculation, while, while the dashed lines are relativistic calculations. And uh, we can see that there is actually a, a big shift uh, in the shape of this uh, photoelectron angular distribution as a result of relativistic effects. The question is, can we reproduce some of those effects, how to describe it? Um, another motivation for studying this uh, system, such as uh, CH3I and iodine, is this comparison of the photo um, ionization cross section, where in the experiment uh, the, 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 value, the maximum value is about 6.5, whereas for CH3I is 11 and for I2 is uh, 10. So there are some differences uh, due to the molecular environment. And so we would like to understand those. And so we did our calculations again for on the very, very simple level. Uh, so we did calculations uh, just uh, um, including uh, uh, final ionic states of uh, singlet spin. Um, and we see that the, you know, the blue curve here is, uh, is the all electron calculation while the ECP curve here, uh, sorry, while the orange curve is the ECP. So we see that there is actually some shift which is, which is non-negligible and we can ascribe this to the inclusion of the relativistic effects effectively on uh, with the ECPs. We can observe similar kind of shift, but uh, in a different direction in photoionization of the 5P shell um, uh, of, of, the, of the atom, both in the cross-section and the angular distribution. An interesting feature of this giant double resonance is that it actually requires a very large continuum basis because it has a complicated structure in space. And so we have to fill it uh, properly with the basis functions to, to describe it correctly. Um, so we can observe now, as opposed to argon, uh, actually a strong effect of these ECPs on the Dyson orbital, which is the initial state for photoionization, here shown for the five, for the photoionization of the 5P shell. So this is uh, most likely the effect of the, the, the relativistic corrections. Uh, so the relativistic effects of the deeper bound, deeper bound electrons on the valence, uh, on the valence shell. Um, we did uh, calculations with more refined models. Uh, so uh, this is uh, first a plot which shows ionization into uh, singlet and triplet um, substates uh, of uh, the 4D shell. Um, and here um, in, in isolation and on the bottom, we see a calculation where all those uh, different uh, states, uh, states of different spin were coupled uh, in, a, in a large close coupling, in a larger close coupling calculation. And we see that now the, the shape of the photoionization cross section is starting to resemble the shape of the experimental one. Although the magnitude is still very much off, we have just rescaled the experiment to, to match our magnitude of the cross-section. But this is fully expected because these calculations are still simple. And the, the, the resonance in, in iodine 
has a complex structure uh, similar to in, in spirit to what we observed in, in CO2, where photoionization of CO2 to the seashell in Hartree Fock picture, which is without any electron correlation, leads to this large peak. But when a large number of ionic states is included, the resonance uh, goes down in magnitude, which means that the resonance actually excites a large number of ionic states. Um, uh, and uh, that's why it's it, the, the peak in a, for uh, when observed uh, in channel in a single channel uh, is 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 much much weaker. So for CO two, we actually had to include something like three hundred states of the ion. So final uh, example, just quickly, I I want to show, which is um, um, let's say a. Uh, a calculation uh, which aims to explore what happens uh, when your source of the electrons is not external, but if we, let's say, hypothesize that we will have some kind of local source of electrons. So in your typical electron scattering experiment, you will have uh, some electron gun which fires uh, electrons on your molecule, and then this can undergo various transformations such as dissociative electron attachment. But the source of the electrons are outside of the system. Now, if we imagine that we have, for example, an atom which is nearby, close to the molecule that we that we wish to somehow transform, we can photoionize this nearby atom, and then the source of the electrons are is is very close to the molecule. And um, in in principle, we can then imagine such processes such as uh, pre-excitation of the molecule by some infrared uh, pulse followed by um, uh, photoionization of the nearby atom, which could perhaps lead to some uh, different reactions because we will have the molecule initially in, a, in an excited state. Um, so just to start, uh, just just to let's say begin this investigation, we did a very very simple calculation of this uh, sodium doped uh, formic acid, um, where um, the the sodium atom is located uh, uh, close to this uh, oxygen end of the molecule, and it's about uh, four four bore away from the center of mass of the molecule. And since the alkali atom is essentially one electron atom, it can effectively uh, act as this electron source because it has a very low um, ionization potential, which means that this uh, uh, the, the lowest bound electron of the system is actually sitting on the, on the sodium atom. To do the calculation, we actually we took advantage very much of these effective core potentials because in case of alkali atoms, it's uh, we can replace all the ten core electrons by by ECPs, so by effective potentials. So in this case, let's say application to to alkali atoms, uh, the ECP is perfect because it's uh, it uh, reduces the atom to only one electron. Um, and we use this Lano, Lano to the double zeta basis set, which includes the, the ECPs. And to represent the continuum, we actually had to use a fairly large R matrix radius of, of 35 bore, um, because this um, uh, electron sitting on the sodium atom is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is fairly diffuse. And so to do that, we, we actually had to use this mixed uh, continuum basis uh, with B splines, which are starting uh, about eight bore away from the center of the molecule. And uh, so to, to actually do the calculation, uh, the ECPs were, were uh, completely uh, indispensable because without them, uh, we would have to do the calculation with the full sodium, uh, with all the sodium electrons included, and that would turn out to be uh, too costly in this uh, mixed uh, continuum basis setup. But uh, in with ECPs, we are only adding one additional electron in. So the number of two electron integrals is reduced to, to the minimum that's required to describe the process I was talking about. So first, we uh, just did some exploratory calculations of electron collisions with um, this uh, um, uh, ionized uh, end of the molecule. Uh, which will be the uh, you know the formic acid, um, and uh, this is just very simple um, Hartree Fock calculation, and we also look at the resonances in the system, and we see that there are actually several low-lying resonances. 
And then in the second step, we looked at photoionization of this whole complex, which leads to uh, photoionization of uh, the sodium atom uh, and uh, leaving this uh, um, formic acid part uh, actually um, uh, intact. And this leads to basically electron collisions with the, the neutral uh, formic acid. And it's described by this uh, photoionization cross-section, which again features a number of peaks uh, that uh, are linked to those resonances uh, that we see in, the, in, in our calculations. And this is all under investigation. So this calculation just to serve to, to show an example where ECPs are actually indispensable to obtain, uh, to, to do the calculation and where they also uh, somehow maximize the efficiency by removing uh, maximum number of electrons. So these are just my conclusions. Uh, so I showed you that we can actually do calculations for very large molecules with UKRML plus, <clears throat> but uh, they, they are currently limited and, and uh, we would be very much assisted by effective core potentials. This is something we will look into in the future. And the effective core potentials are currently available except for spin orbit, uh, but we don't think this is uh, crucial at the moment. And we have shown that uh, the, the ECPs can actually describe partially some of the relativistic effects which uh, are observed in iodine. And the ECPs enable new types of calculations for complexes, such as this uh, sodium doped formic acid. So finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, our collaborators. So first of all, the people who, who actually did uh, many, much of the work on the, on the code, which was uh, Jakub Benda, uh, Martin Serhan, and uh, these are from Prague, and also Marian Sapunar, who worked uh, here in Prague, but is now at Rudolf Boskovic Institute in Croatia. And I would like to acknowledge Mark Kushner, Mackenzie Mayer for the plasma modeling, and our collaborators from Queen's University of Belfast. And finally, of course, Quantimo, uh, our colleagues from Quantimo uh, for uh, for the support and for the collaboration and uh, other sources of funding. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Tanek. That was great. Uh, I think next is Dr. Greg uh, Armstrong from Quantum World. And yeah, I'll give it to him. I'm taking it from here. Sorry, I'll share my screen.